Hey there, welcome back. Uh, so first things first, I now own a straw hat. Uh, love it, however it is slightly uh, too small, so I need to stretch that head part out a little bit. But first, going into this arc, I have finished Fishman Island and I have absolutely adored it. I know there were a couple comments saying, don't go in with too high of expectations. And I think part of that was the fact that I've been told that the future arcs and sagas are just incredible. So like this one reflecting back isn't as memorable or as well handled maybe, but I haven't read those yet. So this was fantastic. I'm going to need to do a ranking on the arcs or sagas or something uh, that I've read so far. And in terms of like sagas, top, top three or four, like I... I really, really, really enjoyed how the themes were handled. I get this is more theme focused than character really focused, but in terms of themes and world building and setting things up for the future and paying off and answering questions and just giving me a lot of tinfoil hat theory ammunition, I had an absolute blast reading this saga uh, or this arc and I think it is, eh, it doesn't matter. Um, and like it resulted in me crying in the train station because Oda will not stop traumatizing me from Marine Ford in the post-war arc. Like that is still hurting my heart and soul when even the tiniest references of those arcs are mentioned in the story. Uh, but jumping right in to Fishman Island, we start with uh, what happens at on Sabadi right after the Straw Hats have left. We start with the fake Straw Hats being buried alive by this guy named Caribou. Or no, yep, Caribou. Uh, he had joined the fake Straw Hats planning on betraying them and using his defeat of them to boost his own notoriety and make himself more feared. So now he's just burying them alive and going to go after the real straw hats for essentially the same purpose. And then we cut to Sentamaru, who is also capturing some of the fake straw hats. I think that he has like two of them. Um, and all the pirates or some of the pirates who had joined the, up with them. But he also says that the real straw hats have gotten away because the Dark King had like gotten his way. And even Uncle Kizaru could not have stopped uh, Rayleigh. And I'm just like, uncle? Uncle? Okay. Uh, and also, yeah, okay, Rayleigh is stronger than an admiral. So there's that. Cutting to Rayleigh, we have him reflecting with um, our lady, uh, who is saying, he's reflecting back on when he first met Bull Roger. And he is wearing the straw hat. And yes, this was a complete shock to me. I did not expect to see him wearing Luffy's hat and previously Shanks hat. Now we know it was previously Roger's hat. So introducing tinfoil hat theories because A, that straw hat has seen some battles and I'm going with it absorbed a devil fruit to make it not fall apart. But the tinfoil hat theories that I do not actually believe will happen, but it made me laugh when I thought of them. So um, Roger has instilled his will or hockey or something into said hat and passes it along to whoever wears it. So that's why Shanks is so powerful. And now that Luffy's had it for so long and got it at such a young formative age, it explains why he has so many... Uh, parallels to Roger, even though we now know for certain that they're not related. And the idea of like an inheritance of will. So I'm going with Roger instilled his will into said straw hat or his hockey, which then goes down to whoever wears it. So Luffy explains why Luffy is so similar to Roger and also like can communicate with the Neptunes, which we have seen in the end of this arc and hear them. And I have not thought it was tinfoil hat theory, but there's something there. Uh, now, the actual crazy theory being that uh, the hat is cursed. Evil Roger, which will be revealed in the future, has cursed the hat to do something. And now both Shanks, Luffy, and also Nami, indirect, 
directly or maybe indirectly, um, have been marked and cursed. Why did I think of that? I don't know. Probably because another character in this saga is uh, able to mark characters. All right, so going back to the straw hats that are now going down and exploring the waters under the island, we have Frankie explaining that when he first got back, he went to go check on the Thousand Sunny. Now that both Duval and Hachi, who have been protecting the ship, have been injured, Hachi had been taken back to Fishman Island now. Uh, and he ended up finding one of the Kuma pacifista robots that was protecting the ship. And he's all confused, but the, I think it was Rayleigh or the robot, probably Rayleigh, uh, explains that Kuma had revealed to him that he is still or was still a member of the revolution and had had a final program put in to protect the ship until one of the Straw Hats returned. And that leads to more questions. So why is he working for the military? Why did he agree to become, in, become this uh, human robot weapon? I'm still leaning towards he either was being blackmailed or threatened, or more likely for me, he implanted a second program into his mind that will eventually allow Dragon to take control of this army of Kumas and turn the tides in whatever war is being planned. Um, it also leads me to ask, why did this doctor doing this um, allow that program to be put in? Because he had to ask the doctor to put that program to protect the Sunny in there. And I'm going with either Kuma was blackmailing or threatening the doctor, or the doctor is a part of the revolution. I don't actually like that part of the theory, but maybe. Um, it would explain how the second program would get in there, too. Maybe. Maybe he's also a member of the revolutionary, but there's something going on with both Kuma and the doctor, very obviously. Okay, uh, next, uh, we're, we're down under the water. And someone had asked Zoro how he got that scar on his eye. And I found it very funny and frustrating that the response we get is um, Zoro's about to answer. And I'm like, yes, yes, tell me, tell me about what happened with my darling love, uh, Mihawk, and your training with him and how you got this scar. And then we just go on a side tangent instead. Someone else starts, uh, Nami starts explaining ocean currents and the saltiness of the water. And I'm just like, the biology major in me loves it. But, um, I really, really want to know what happened with my darling love, Mihawk. Uh, next, we're caught up with Caribou, who is uh, planning on killing the Straw Hat. So he is uh, trying to take on the ship, but it's being dragged by the Sea Cow that was a member of Arlong's group, which means that as soon as the Sea Cow recognizes like Luffy and Sanji and Nami, he's like, uh, screw that, I'm getting out of here. So he pulls uh, Caribou's ship away during the time that they're trying to invade the bubble and uh, only caribou makes it on the boat. So he goes from, all right, attack, kill all the straw hats to where's my crew? They're all gone. I'm alone here. I'm outnumbered. I'm outmatched. Oh crap. Um, Hey, I'm not the captain. I hated those guys. Uh, can I stay on your crew and you take me to Fishman Island, please? And the straw hats are not complete idiots. So they're like, do we trust this guy? What happened? So they end up tying him up and eventually end up like locking him in a barrel. And I just thought it was really funny. This caribou guy is honestly pathetic, but also kind of scary, kind of sadistic, but mostly pathetic and funny. I also really liked it when he realized um, he's on a ship with a bunch of crazy people because as they're going down like this underwater waterfall, he's telling them, oh no, there's a monster there, run away from it. We see this big kraken, who is a sweetheart, darling, lovely boy. I'm assuming boy, I don't really know. Um, I love this kraken so very much. And anyone who threatens this kraken may burn in hell. We will talk to it later. It's what got me crying in the, in the train station. But Luffy looks at this monster that has just destroyed a ship, Caribou's former ship, and caused all the pirates on it to like float up. And I think it was Zoro is just like, hmm, they look like jelly jellyfish. And I'm like, so rude. People just died, <laughs> presumably. Um, Luffy looks at this monster and just goes, oh my God, let's tame it. I want it to be our friend. It can pull our ship. And if that is not the heart and soul of Monkey D. Luffy and the ascension, ascension will be like, look at a monster and just go, ooh, kitty, I want to pet it. I, I don't know what it is. I love it so very much. So Luffy wants to leave the bubble to go um, 
attack the Kraken and try to tame it. And I also, side note, I also love whenever something is attacking the ship, um, Luffy and Zoro and them go to charge through, but they're not allowed popping the bubble too many times. Like one person at a time can almost send something through, but if you send too many things through the bubble, it will pop and they'll all drown and die. So it's like Usopp and Chopper and them or, or um, Robin pulling them back from doing something stupid after just telling them we all can't attack through the bubble at the same time. So eventually, um, who goes excited? Zoro and Luffy and Sanji are all put in this underwater bubble kind of thing so they can go out and uh, fight the Kraken. But Nami tells them to take the safety rope thing tied around them so they can bring them back to the ship eventually. And they're just like, let's go and do not bring said rope. So they're out there fighting the Kraken. Um, Luffy gets upset when I think Sanji is beating him up and Zoro ends up slicing off one of his tentacles. And it's just like, hey, I, I need it intact. It can't like pull our ship if we cut off all its legs. And at one point it spits out this big shark which floats away, which will become important later. And then there's, they all fall down. There's an ocean current. There's a volcano. Uh, and they're all swept away. They're presumed dead. Clearly they're not. They all just get put in one big bubble. And the rest of the crew have to go and find them. And it gets dark and creepy. And there's like an anglerfish. And it just shows how haunting and terrifying the ocean can be and why I love the ocean so much. So I really enjoyed all of that. We highlight Frankie's design. And while I personally prefer aesthetically how Frankie looked previously, I am loving this new design because it is just perfect in terms of this is what Frankie would do. It's over the top, it's big, it's loud. And then he's like, hmm, it's really dark down here. I can't see through the darkness. Let me turn on my lights. And I forget if it's Usopp or Chopper is just Chopper is just like, oh, are your eyes going to glow? No, no, it's nipple lights. And I'm like, of course it is. That is 100% what Frankie would do and upgrade his robot body with. Eventually, um, they are able to find um, uh, the rest of the crewmates who were out and, and are all put in one bubble when they're attacked by this giant sea monster and the Kraken comes and saves them. And Luffy's just like, yeah, get him, because they have now tamed the Kraken, made his, their friend, fights the sea monster. And then when Luffy, Sanji, and Zoro get back on the ship, the Kraken being the sweetest, cutest little thing is so adorable in these in these little panels, puts the, the Thousand Sunny on his head, and he looks right sweet and gentle with it, and he's going along, and they're headed to Fishman Island. And it is so wonderful. I really love the journey to get here almost as much as I loved everything that came came after it. Um, we then are introduced to the new Fishman pirates who may all burn in hell. So they threaten um, the Kraken and call and insult him and say, how dare you be taking orders from humans? What's wrong with you? And the Kraken runs away. And the new Fishman pirates are just like, hey, you're the guys who took down Arlong, but you're also the ones who punched a celestial dragon in the face. So this is a little bit iffy. We were going to kill you for what you did to Arlong, but it, instead we'll give you the opportunity. Join us or we'll sink your boat. And Luffy laughs in their face. God love Monkey D. Luffy. He's not having any of it. He's ready to fight, but the rest of the crew are just like, oh, we got to go. We're running out of air. Let's, let's get inside Fishman Island. So they go up in there, um, flee with the last remaining oxygen in the ship to push them forward and end up in like Mermaid Cove, but they're, some of them are separated. Um, forgot to mention, we also ran into the Flying Dutchman, who is pirated by uh, the Vander Decken, who will play a part later in the story. But right now we're at the Mermaid Cove with Cammy and some of the Straw Hats, and she's showing them around. And now seems like the best time to just address Sanji, and then I'm not bringing it up again. Um, I hate it. I hate him. Yes, I will trust Oda to make it better in the future. I've been told don't give up on Sanji. It's explained or he gets better. It's not, it doesn't last too much longer. Um, but he is very much annoying me. And it's not even just the fact that he is being a perverted character and getting nosebleeds to the point of almost dying and that becoming a plot point. Like he looks at a mermaid or is being held by a mermaid and he has a nosebleed 
and he loses so much blood that it brings up the plot point of fishmen and the stigma and a law against giving blood to a human because supposedly um, tigerfish had lost a lot of blood and a human refused to give him blood to save his life. So now the fishmen made a law that you can't give humans your blood. And that being a whole plot point and them having to rush off to save Sanji. But it is the fact that this character trope and what happens in manga and anime is usually just such lazy writing that is used by, it really feels like the story and characters can't stand on their own, so they need some gag to keep people invested, because the author, honestly, this is just personal opinion and what it feels like to me, I could be wrong, I probably am, but it feels like they don't have the talent to write a story and characters to keep you invested, so they need this gag to keep you watching and it feels lazy and that does not sound like something Oda should be associated with. He is better than that and I really hate that it's in his story. But he can write whatever he wants. I'm sure there's impact by editors and all that and blah blah blah. I'm moving past it. I don't want to dwell on it. I don't like it. Uh, so Sanji's dying of blood loss for I'm going to pretend any other reason than what actually happened. And uh, Cammy's just like, hey, uh, she's explaining that it, there's this stigma against giving blood to humans. Yes, fishman blood is compatible with human blood. They could do it, but the stigma prevents anyone from volunteering. So they have to rush them away, uh, fight off the princes, steal their <laughs> whale thing, ship, whatever ship it was, animal, um, and go off. And really, the princes weren't actually there to arrest them. They were there to give a message from Jimbei about um, him not having left Fishman Island. He's in the sea forest and not to fight this guy um, named... I've been calling him Howdy in my head, and I know that's wrong. So just give me a second. Howdy. Howdy, Howdy Jones. Uh, forgive me if I call him Howdy at any point in time during this video. Cody Jones, um, who is, who we met before as the leader of the new Fishman Pirates. Uh, the stigma about the blood transfusion comes from the time that, um, the fish tiger revolutionary freeing the slaves pirate had been dying of blood loss, but, uh, a human had refused to give him blood. So now they've instilled an actual law on Fishman Island that they can't, a fishman cannot give blood to a human. So Cammy and them take the Straw Hats and Sanji to the Mermaid Cafe run by Madame Shakir, Shakiri, shark kind of mermaid lady. She's very good. She's giving, she's hiding them, allowed uh, two humans that were there to give a blood transfusion. And Sanji's going to be fine so long as he doesn't look at any more mermaids. Um, and now they go off and leave uh, Chopper and Chomper, Chopper and Sanji there, and they go off to meet the starfish guy. However, the madam lady, she has a prophecy. She can see the future, and she sees a man in a straw hat destroying Fishman Island. So she's screaming, someone go stop them, stop the straw hats. Luffy's going to destroy everything. Now, she thinks it's Luffy. Awful convenient that we get this prophecy of a man in a straw hat destroying Fishman Island. The same arc we learned that Roger wore the straw hat before. And I love that for my tinfoil hat theory of Roger being alive and the ultimate villain. Granted, it could still be Shanks, but I, I, my heart can't take that. My heart and soul can't take that betrayal from Luffy. So I'm going to hope it's Roger. So they go off and uh, to... The starfish guy meet him, uh, only to run into Nami, and so we got most of the crew back together, and now the king has showed up, and he comes along as just like Straw Hat, you actually saved that shark earlier from the Kraken, that was my daughter's pet, so why don't you come to the palace, we're going to have a feast and a banquet to welcome you here, I don't care that you entered the island illegally. And they're like, cool, let's go. Oh, you're telling me uh, that Zoro's already there and he started drinking without us? That's fine. That's fine. So they all get to the palace. The advisors and guards are like, King, sir, King Neptune, you can't just leave the palace without your guards and being unsupervised like this. It's not safe. He's like, ah, it's fine. Luffy gets impatient and just wants some food. So he goes off in search of food and ends up in the princess's room. 
And she has been locked in this shell tower all, well, not all her life, for the past 10 years because an assassin is trying to kill her. So when someone just enters and steps on her, she thinks she's being attacked, thinks it's another assassin, says like, um, I'm not afraid of you, you can't scare me. And then he, Luffy says or does something and yells at her and she breaks into tears and she's crying. She's so upset. And Luffy's just like, you know, I kind of hate you. You're a big crybaby. But he has this grin on his face when he says it. And he's eating her food. And Oda is still traumatizing me from the post-war arc. Because as soon as he says, like, you're a crybaby, I kind of hate you. I'm just, he is in Ace's spot. Uh, the princess is in his old spot. And it's this immediate love and dynamic between them for me that I'm watching. And I'm like... Nothing can happen to this princess. Luffy is not allowed to see her hurt or die. He is going to protect her. And he just keeps calling her a crybaby or whiny every time. Like he never calls her by name and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it right now. Um, and I love it. I love this dynamic between them immediately. Um, so the person who is trying to kill her is the Vander, Dic Vander Dicken Dickens Dickens. I'm going with Vander Dickens. Vanderdecken. He is trying to kill her because supposedly he's in love with her and he has the devil fruit that if he throws something, it can always hit his target. He had to have touched his target at some point to mark them. Uh, and he's throwing axes and other crazy things at her every time like she rejects a marriage proposal. So a lot of times there's a note saying, marry me on the axe. And it's either marry me or die. And because of this, she's been locked in the tower for her protection for the past 10 years. And she just wants to get out and go to the sea forest to visit her mother's grave. So when Luffy had said like, hey, don't you want to get out of this tower? She's like, I can't, I can't, it's not safe. Well, I can protect you. Just let's, let's go. I'd, I'd go stir crazy locked in this tower for 10 years. Let's get out of here. Let's go on an adventure. So the princess is just like, you can take me to the sea forest, get me home safely and just protect me while I'm out there. And he's like, of course I can. So that's what they do. Uh, she stuffs herself in the shark's mouth and they just go out on an adventure. Meanwhile, uh, Caribou had been released from his barrel and is abducting mermaids. So, cause obviously sell them into slavery, make a lot of money up on the surface. But um, the people are just like, hey, awful coincidence that these humans show up and now mermaids are going missing. It must be them being kidnapped. So they're off looking for the straw hats in addition to the prophecy of um, Luffy destroying Fishman Island. So this gets back to the king who is just like, oh, that's not good. So everyone's just like, okay, we already have the straw hats in the castle. Let's just arrest them till we get to the bottom of this. The king's just like, we can't arrest them for an accusation. We got no proof. They haven't destroyed Fishman Island yet. I'm not going to arrest them for something they might do. We don't know what's happening with these mermaids. I don't know what to do. But it's like, all right, we already captured Zoro. So I'm picturing Zoro just being drunk and them leading him down into the dungeons and him being locked up and he's just sitting down there having a drink, having a good time, doesn't really know that he's really been arrested. And then the rest of the crew, they go to arrest them and hearing the fighting, Zoro's just like, huh, guess I'll break out and go join the fighting. So he goes back up and joins the fight. Um, there's no actual evidence that Zoro was ever, ever arrested, just a, a one line comment. So it's possible they, he just jumped the gun and thought Zoro was arrested, but that I prefer my thought process. Uh, so the crew ha are fighting and Cammy's just being like, stop fighting the guards. And the crew's just like, they started it. What do you want us to do? So long as they're attacking us, we're going to attack them. The king's just like, let us hold you captive till we get this, to get to the bottom of this. And the crew's just like, no, we're not doing that. So they end up taking over the castle. Usopp is miles, is more frustrated. Like, Zoro, you took it too far. I wanted to intimidate them. And then we could have ran and not like beat everyone up and tie them up and actually take them hostage. And uh, he's like, well, what do you want me to do? Then the princes get on the phone. It's like, hey, what's going on? And Zoro's just like, we have your father and everyone held hostage. Uh, code our boat with the bubble and we'll leave peacefully. And Nami's also just like, and also give us this sum of uh, money, a million or a billion berries. 
and Usopp's like, will you stop it? He's trying to de-escalate the situation, get them out of trouble, and everyone else is like escalating the situation because of whatever else is happening around them. And I absolutely love it. It's hilarious. Um, uh, Vander Dickens guy, he's still throwing things at the princess, but now he's ready to invade the castle. So he throws human slaves at the castle to invade and open up the gates. And so they are coming in just as the princess and Luffy are leaving. And when, uh, Brooke and when the other castle guards come back saying, Hey, the princess is missing. And then the gates get opened and Vanderdecken's guy comes on in the King who is tied up and imprisoned is just like, give me my daughter. I will hunt you to hell. Like whoever has her, um, another fight ensues and Zoro, being the lovely honorable swordsman that he is, recognizes that his hostages are in danger and he, they can no longer protect them, guarantee their safety as promised, lets them go to A, either fight or most likely just run and get away. And he's staying to fight Howdy, not Howdy, Hody. I like Howdy better. He's stupid. He deserves a stupid name. Um... And the king tries to even help the Straw Hats to get away from this, but it is end up captured. So the king is captured as well as Zoro and uh, Brooke and Usopp, but Nami ends up getting away with Kami to go hunt down Luffy. Luffy and uh, the princess are going across the village and they run into U no, not Usopp, uh, Chopper and Sanji who are getting into a fight because, hey, Missing Mermaids, also your friends just took over our kingdom's castle and are holding our king and everyone hostage. And he gets down and is like, hey, what's going on? And then the princess falls out of the, the shark and everyone's like, Luffy has kidnapped the princess. So they tie up Luffy. And the princess tries to swim away. No, 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 she doesn't. She tries to explain the situation. But um, eventually, yeah, she tries to get away a little bit. But Luffy's like, hey, I can't protect you if you're not close to me. So she stays just as like the axes are coming. No, a big piece of coral. That's what it is. Vander Deckens had thrown a piece of coral and he's riding on top of it being like, princess, marry me. And she's like, no, you're not my type. And he's like, well, then die. But uh, Luffy, still all tied up, jumps up. And um, starts fighting Vanderdecken's guy. And eventually him and uh, Sanji and Chopper and Nami, no, Nami isn't there yet, uh, are going away along with an injured Hachi. Now he had been attacked by Hody guy um, for refusing to agree to attack the Straw Hats and being their friend and allied with them and not going along with his plan of... Uh, uprising with the new Fishman Pirates to take over Fishman Island, who they have also made an alliance with the Vanderdeckens guy. So they're all heading off to the sea forest for the princess, which coincidentally um, is where Jinbei is. And that message never got to Luffy to meet him in the forest, but he's going to get there anyway. All right, so while we're catching up with Jinbei, Robin is also looking for the Poundglyphs that, that she knows is there and learning about someone named Joy Boy, which I'll get into later, but I honestly don't know, really have any theories for that. And Frankie is meeting with one of Tom's brothers who uh, is still alive and is going to coat the Thousand Sunny so they can get out of here. And Jinbei apologizes for his role in Arlong's everything that happened with him and how it affected Nami. And I'm just like, excuse you, what did you have to do with Arlong? And we now go into probably one of my favorite flashbacks of the series, but how dare Oda give me a backstory to make me empathize with a character I hate. I have a strong suspicion this is going to be a recurring theme. So there were two people who were really taking a stand against the oppression of Fishman and how them as a society should move forward in the world that they're in. You have the tiger fish or fish tiger who was a pirate, former slave we learned, he was in slavery, escaped, came back and rescued the slaves and formed the sun pirates to um, fight against the government. And he wasn't so much a, I hate humans. He was, he could not get past his hatred for humans, but that was not his core motivation. He tried to move past it. He just couldn't. And it was more of, 
I am fighting against oppression. So if a human is a slave, I will free them. I will return them to their home. We will treat them well and hopefully they will tell their people the good things about the fishmen. But I am going to fight anyone oppressing and the government and celestial dragons and I don't want to kill anyone because killing with hatred in my heart will make me no better than these people that we're fighting against. Of course, Arlong has an issue with this. He just wants to kill everybody for all the atrocities that he suffered. Um, this eventually leads to Arlong's capture um, after Tigerfish's death. Essentially, the Tigerfish or Fish Tiger had been returning this human slave child to her home village and um, her people betrayed the Tigerfish or Fish Tiger, I keep forgetting which order it goes in, uh, to the government in exchange for letting them keep this child. And he gets rescued by his crew, but um, refuses to accept any of the blood that they had on the ship because it was human blood. And he would rather die than have their tainted evil blood in him. And he told his crew, do not let anyone know this. Don't tell them that I died this way. Don't let them know that I still held this anger towards them. So he was... He's just a very interesting character and I really liked everything of his ideals and how he couldn't break the cycle of hatred. He was trying to, but he just couldn't. Contrast that with Queen Odahime, who is... At first I disliked her so very much, but very quickly I realized how much I loved her. So she is completely idealistic. She is forgive and put away the hatred. We have only interacted with a very small group of humans, the ones who are oppressing us, the ones who are capturing us and fighting us, but there are so many more. And there are hundreds of thousands of leagues of sea between the two of us and so much cultural distance and misunderstandings and we need to educate ourselves. And... um which is all well and good, but she just wants to move completely past it and migrate to the surface as if there's not people putting her people in slavery. And I'm like, why would you want to bring your people up to that when you're safe down here? I didn't understand it. And then um, she ends up like slapping the face of this fishman thief who was robbing a store and holding someone, I think at knife point, she slaps him in the face. And he explains like, I had no choice, forgive me my queen, but my, my business burned down, I was robbed. I have to do this to feed my children. And she's just like, why, like your children would not want, not, would not want to be supported on this stolen dirty money when you're perpetuating this cycle of someone did something bad to you, so now you're doing bad to someone else. It's just going to keep getting worse for everybody. And again, I'm just like, my queen, his kids want to be fed. I, I understand, but I, I understand stealing and kidnapping is wrong, but you can't just say his children wouldn't want to be fed if the money was dirty. But then she starts crying like, I am sorry for you that I as the ruler have failed you and allowed this environment to hurt you and make you feel like you're forced into this kind of position. I'm like, oh, so she does get it. So she's completely idealistic, but she realizes that part of it is the environment. We're just trying to move past it so quickly. And then I finally get why she wants to go to the surface. She explains like all this sea, hundreds, thousands, all these miles of sea. Um, and it's just like, we chose to build Fishman Island in the one place where there is sun. And how about we go up to the surface to see the real sun, not just what's trickling down from Sabadee. And it is our actual dream to be up there. And the humans are what's preventing our dream. We can't kill all the humans. We can only educate and learn to uh, work with them. And let's be peaceful. I'm like, oh, okay. There's a reason for this. They're not, she doesn't want to keep them down here in the environment that they're in. It makes sense. And she knows the only way for them to live in peace and be happy up on the surface world is to break this cycle. Because if she can, if her people continue to fight, then their people are going to continue to fight and it will never end. So she has the strength to recognize that despite all the oppression her and her people have faced, they have to be the ones to break this cycle. And she is honestly just a 
quite a lot stronger and more forgiving than I could ever hope to be. Um, we then learn more about the Fishman District. So where Arlong and Jimbei and Hachi and Hody are all from was an, originally an orphanage and it was mishandled and corruption and evil management kind of thing led to another environment where those people were hearing stories about tigerfish and oppression and the hatred of humanity and making like a religious quest to that fish men are better than humans and just perpetuating fear and hatred. Whereas here on Fishman Island, uh, they had the queen preaching about forgiveness and acceptance and education and teaching about sea creatures and the sky and forests and a dream for a better life. So children are just being raised and exposed to a different environment. That plays a big role in the moment that made me really appreciate this queen. When a celestial dragon came down to um, try to get back some of the slaves that the tigerfish had uh, freed and his ship is nearly destroyed um, he's on the ground, he's injured, his mask thing is broke, and the fishmen are just like, if we kill him now, then everyone's just going to think he died in the shipwreck. It won't get back to us. We can kill him and get away with this. So Buddy shoots him, but the queen jumps in the way and takes that bullet. And I'm just thinking, because I'm thinking that this is some different author that is not Oda. And I'm like, oh, that's so stupid. How could she sacrifice her life? She's going to die now protecting this horrible person. It's That is so stupid. No, no, I need to learn to trust Oda because the queen is just like, you can't do this not in front of the, kill in front of the children. She took that bullet because there were kids watching and she didn't want them to see the hatred and the anger and have that burned into their impressionable minds. And she does not die, thankfully. Um, so the celestial dragon is going back up to the surface with no slaves, but the queen says that I'm going to go with you. And the king is just like, ah, the hell you are. No, or at least you're taking a guard with you. And she's like, no, I can't ask my people to migrate to the surface, which they know is dangerous. If that's not a risk I'm willing to take, this only works because I am weak and vulnerable. I am putting faith and trust in the humans to negotiate with them and get a peace treaty kind of thing going on to make us welcomed up there to make this an option. So she goes up, completely unguarded. And I'm, I'm like, oh God, she is a queen. She's a fish person. She's a mermaid. She's going to be sold into slavery. No, no. The darling queen negotiates with the nobles and gets a document signed welcoming, welcoming them to some kind of meeting up in the surface world and all they need is signatures from the fish people just to say like hey we do want to come up there we're willing to work on this and the queen had been working on this for years and years and years trying to get signatures on a petition to say hey we want to migrate to the surface world and it kept going back and forth between no signatures people taking their signatures back children saying i need to take my signature back because my parents said no and side note my darling lovely gorgeous better than anybody queen um don't don't have children sign legal documents. They are under the age of like adulthood, whatever your adulthood is. Don't do that to them. Besides the point. Uh, now she's getting even more signatures coming in and people are really starting to open up to the idea of moving past all of the horrible history that they've been prosecuted against and going to the surface, which supposedly is their dream to go up under the true sun. And I just really, really love that. But again, she is a better person than me to put everything that has happened to her people behind them and recognize that to continue hatred, continue fighting is just perpetuating the circle of hatred and it will never end. So it has to end with her and the upcoming generations. And I think both her and Tigerfish realize that. Even if they themselves, like the king can't get past his hatred of humans for a very justifiable reason later on. Tigerfish couldn't get rid of, it couldn't get past his hatred, but they recognized we can't allow the generation coming after us to inherit that hatred. They have to be free to get their own pers their own impressions and impressions and judgments free of what happened to us. We have to move past it. Um, the new captain of the Sunfish Pirates is Jimbei, and he is, uh, still working under Tigerfish's previous kind of orders in not killing 
humans knowing that that's just going to cause more harm to the fishmen. And he decides that the best thing for him to do is to accept the title as a warlord as it'll allow him to continue to protect his people and hopefully get more peace going between the humans and the fishmen. However, this also results in, um, he, he also does it so the sunfish, no, the sun pirates can return home and not be prosecuted as uh, escape slaves. But this also results in Arlong being set free. And Arlong is not good with everything that's happened. He's, God knows what's happened to him in uh, the, was it G1 or 8, something like that, whatever, G1 uh, prison camp that he was being held hostage in. Um, and then everything we know about his upbringing as childhood in the Fishman District, combined with that, his previous um, wanting to interact in uh, the Sabadi Park, and he wanted to make that a place where he can go a dream to fulfill. So when he left, because he wasn't happy with how the Sun Pirates were being organized, um, and he went to Kokoraku Village, Nami's hometown, and built Arlong Park. Like it was a fulfillment of his dreams. I did not ask to empathize with Arlong. Um, he is attacking humans, and he's essentially enslaving that village. To the point that Nami specifically was essentially working as a slave. She got tattooed or branded with Arlong's pirate ship, which she then, just like the slave mark of uh, the Celestial Dragons and the World Government thing, remade it into the one with the tangerines and the windmill when she was freed and went with Luffy. Just like they took that mark and turned it into the sun symbol. And if that's not good parallels and writing, I don't know what is. Um, Nami forgives Jinbei for his part in releasing Arlong, especially considering Arlong had been bribing the government uh, to not let word of what he was doing get back to Jinbei, because he knew Jinbei would have came back and tried to stop him, would have stopped him. Um, but Nami forgives Jinbei for his part, saying, I, don't, I will never forgive Arlong for what he did to me, my family, and my home. But you had no part in that, and I don't hate Fishman. I will forgive you, or I have nothing to forgive for you. And it's just beautiful. Uh, Sanji had told, like, um, Jinbei to, like, commit suicide, because that's the only way you're going to make up for this. So, again, Nami, more forgiving. Uh, going back to the flashback ten years ago, we have the queen has been shot by that uh, man trying to kill the celestial dragon, and then the Neptunes or Sea Kings came up out of the water trying to protect her, or were summoned or called. We learn that the princess Shirahoshi, I feel like that's the name. I, I like calling her whiny or crybaby because that's once once Luffy called her. Um, Shirahoshi had called for them. So every couple hundred years, a mermaid is born with the power to communicate with the Neptunes. And that is just an incredibly strong power and very rare. Um, we get Vanderdecken who sees this and knows of like a prophecy story and is like, oh, I need that power for myself. I need, I need that kid. And cause she is a child, she's like six years old. Um, and then the, his crew is just like, hey, if you marry her, then you'll have her power. We can get this treasure, the prophesized treasure that your ancestor has been after. And he's like, great idea. And they're like, but she's six. And he's like, good point. Uh, but she'll grow up. She'll be an adult and I can marry her then. So that explains why he's been pursuing her these past 10 years. Now, the queen has gotten a lot of signatures. They're doing construction outside. And I, I almost feel like there's someone on my balcony. So I apologize if I keep looking over there. Um, um, so the queen has gotten a lot of signatures and they're in this big box, but all of a sudden they get set on fire and everyone's rushing to try to save them. And then someone shoots the queen and I'm pissed. We then get a supposed assassin end up being human. Uh, con completely coincidentally though, the one who caught the assassin is that Hody guy. Completely coincidentally. Uh, so he kills that human assassin. The queen is dying and she makes the daughter and the sons and all promise uh, not to hate the person who killed her. And the princess realizes because a little while later who is responsible and chooses not to hold hatred in her heart for him. And again, stronger than I would have been. During all this chaos, the Vanderdecken guy touches um, the princess and marks her. And that's why he's been able to throw those axes at her. 
Um, and then we get the, hey, marry me first attack. And she gets locked in the tower for the past 10 years. Uh, the princes also cannot attend the funeral because they don't know who assassinated the queen and it's not safe for the royal family to be there. But they announce through the projectors saying, hey, we are going to continue with our mother's legacy. We're going to want to continue to migrate to the surface, but we understand that we need to wait for you to move past and forgive and open your hearts to the idea of living with humans again. So we're going to put all the signatures that were saved aside and we're going to restart the process of taking the signatures to migrate to the human world in like the next six years. Or there's another council meeting thing in 12 years time. Like eventually we'll get there. We'll continue our mother's work, but we're going to wait for you to open your hearts up again. And that's kind of how the flashback more or less ends. Now we're back in the present time with um, Hody being like, I have the king, I just got the, all the princes, I'm going to execute them in the town square, um, unless like the princess comes and gives herself up. Uh, we know this because he is after terrified of the power she holds about the controlling the Neptunes. And Luffy is also just like, hey, you also have my friends who are going to be executed uh, after the king and the princes have been executed. So I'm going to go and I'm going to kick your ass. And Jinbei is just like, no, Luffy, you can't. Luffy's like, they, what? Have you met this guy? He's terrible. I don't care you told me not to fight Hody. I'm going to go kill him. He has my crew. And Jinbei is all, you don't understand the optics. And it's a very, very good point because all the fishmen are going to see is Howdy being attacked by a human and he'll, he'll turn him into a martyr. It'll just continue to fuel that cycle of hatred. He can't just run in and fight an attack. Luffy does not care how it looks. This guy has my crew. I'm going to kill him. Eventually they come up with a plan. So uh, the princess and Jinbei go and end up getting captured and brought to Howdy where ha I like the name Howdy for him more. Howdy and he ex poses that uh, he was really the one who killed the queen. And the princess is just like, I knew. But I promised my mother I would not hold hatred for her killer. I would not continue that cycle. It wouldn't be good. And again, stronger than me. But uh, Hody is just like, you are so pathetic. How can you not hold hatred for the person who killed your mother? And now that you didn't turn me in when you found out, I am going to kill your father, your brothers. I'm going to destroy your home and all these people. This is all your fault. And Jimmy's just like, not your fault. This is on him. This is his doing, not yours. You are stronger for not holding on to this hatred. Um, and the people of the Fishman Island are just like, this needs to end. This can't go on. What do we do? Uh, we heard about this prophecy of the Straw Hat Boy coming and destroying Fishman Island. We need the Straw Hat to save us now. And they're calling for Luffy. They are pleading for him to come and save them. And if there's one thing I love, it is people in a desperate situation begging for help. And they are not praying to God. They are praying to Monkey D. Luffy. And who comes out of the shark who've been hiding in the stomach and is just like, all right, I'm here. You call for me. Now I'm allowed to kill you. And uh, Nami had been using a mirage to steal the keys to unlock Jinbei and the princess. And um, with the help of Robin and Sanji had went to the castle and rescued uh, Zoro, Usopp, and Brooke, who had really already saved themselves. Zoro had, may or may not have chopped down half the tower building. And they were just kind of waiting for a ride to get here. So everyone in the Straw Hats are back and they're just ready to show off how strong they've come the past two years. Howdy is, again, I really like this name, Howdy, it suits him better. Howdy is just like, I have a crew of 100,000 men, a combination of fishmen and I think it's like 30,000 uh, human slaves. So he is a slaver willing to kill his own people for his idolize. He's a terrible person. And Luffy is just like, you said you were going to be the new king of Fishman Island. I don't care what kind of king you were going to be, but you pissed me off when you said you were going to be the king of the pirates. There is only room for one king of the pirates and that's me so monkey d luffy the glorious man that he is unleashes the conqueror's hockey and like takes out half of that hundred thousand instantly and everyone's just like oh damn and zoro and sanji are like yeah that's a bit right now let's go kill him so fighting breaks out standout moments uh for me like i already expected zoro to be absolutely killing it that was not a surprise love to see it 
Uh, I like seeing Sanji's like air walking technique, but again, I expected that from him. Not, not that spe uh, specific technique, but just for him to be awesome in fighting. What I was most entertained with was A, Nami's weather power controls. I was really happy to see that. Loved it. Uh, Usopp, of course, has been a standout from the beginning with back when they were getting to Fishman Island, holding up the debris from the, the volcanoes and the avalanche thing that was coming after them. Uh, he's taking on multiple ones. Uh, but mostly, I really love to Frankie. Again, I aesthetically, I loved his design before, but this new re re redesign of him is just completely him, and it's hilarious and wonderful. So he's got this, like, big mech suit, and he's fighting there. Chopper, with, Chopper was um, using it at one point, but Frankie takes over, and he's just like, all right, um, shoulder cannon missile time. And they're like, cool, but it's just like Frankie popping out of a cockpit kind of thing, just little him, like, pew, pew, pew. And it reminds me so much of um, Water 7 or Ennis Lobby, where you're saying, like, all right, um, tracker missiles, and it's just him shooting missiles while running. <laughs> and it was, it is completely Frankie. It's over the top. It's loud. It's obnoxious. And I love it. It was great seeing him fight. Uh, and finally, Brooke. There is a moment there, and I'll put the panel on screen, where he talks about, like, fighting, like, a cold soul death. I don't know. Oh, if this could be a horror manga, it would be terrifying seeing him fight, and I love it. All right, so Vanderdecken is still around, and he's pissed that the princess still refuses to marry him. So he throws a full-on shit, marks it, she's still marked, uh, throws it at her, and the Noah is what it is. Massive ship, and it's going to kill her and the entirety of Fishman Island, so that's on the way. Meanwhile, big giant monster giant fish is, guy is attacking, and the Kraken shows up to attack that monster. And Luffy is just like, hey, Kraken, sweet darling boy Kraken, uh, protect the princess. So he's being all sweet and covering her and protecting her. And it's adorable. And I love him. And um, Hody Guy is just like, hey, Kraken, I still know about your brother up north. If you don't kill the princess, I'm going to kill your brother. So Kraken starts squeezing the princess. And Luffy, my sweet darling boy, Monkey D, do not mess with my friend's brother Luffy looks at the Kraken and calmly said, calm, more calm than I would have been. So you have a brother. That's why you're um, taking his orders. Is he a younger brother or an older brother? Why don't you let me protect him too? And I am sobbing in the train station when I read that panel because Oda has not stopped traumatizing me since the Marine Ford and Post War arc. I, it, he's stabbing me in the heart and I can't take it. Kraken trusts Luffy, does not hurt the princess. And Luffy, in response to everything that has happened, punches this man in the face, or kicks him in the face. God love him. He doesn't care about anything else. He's walking straight through. Sanji and Zoro and the rest of the crew are clearing a path. Armored hockey, bam, right on top of him. And God love him. It was satisfying. I really loved every fight in this arc. Uh, but Howdy, however, is still alive, especially he's also transformed and has got more power because powerful because he's been taking these drugs, uh, steroid enhancers, giving him more power, allowing him to keep fighting, even though he's in pain and injured. Um, side note, I do know he got these drugs from that like treasure box in the vault of the kingdom when he still worked there as a guard. However, if we're at all following like real life um, implications, then I'm going to assume those drugs were manufacture, manufactured or given to or something to do with governments, the world governments or the Navy or something. They're, they're somehow responsible for those drugs ending up in the fish man's hands, probably to incite and make conflict internally for them to benefit the world government in some way. Um, okay. So giant ship is about to crash down and kill everybody. Um, so she, um, the princess, she knows that it's after her. So she swims up to get it away from the island. And um, Cody is pissed that Vanderdecken would have killed him with it. And also realized, you know what? Destroying the entire island sounds like a good idea. So while the princess is swimming up and it's following her, if I kill Vanderdecken, then it's just going to the devil's fruit power will end and it'll just fall and crash down. So he's gone up to kill him. Luffy, with the help of Sanji and the prince, are going up to protect the princess and to stop the boat. And more fighting ensues. 
And eventually, uh, Hody Guy does stab Vanderdeck, and it's falling down. They don't know what to do. And the prince had been told by the king, don't let the Noah be destroyed. There's a promise made with Joy Boy uh, on behalf of the fishermen to protect this ark, and they need to keep it intact. But the prince realizes something during the fight when he is attacked by Hody. He had not been the Hody New Fish Pirate guy. He has no personal impact of humans. Humans done nothing to him personally. All his hatred in this vendetta and everything he hates has been built up due to the environment he was raised in. And he's like, we don't need our past anymore. Luffy, save us, destroy that boat. And Luffy's just like, if there is oxygen, if there's air on that boat, I can fight. So um, the... Fishman shoot a bubble at the boat so Luffy can fight there. Hody ends up on the boat. Um, people are pulling at... What were they pulling at? I can't remember. They're pulling on a chain or something trying to stop... I think it was the Ark from moving and they were hopelessly doing it. And Hody was shooting at them, pissing Luffy off. There were so many good moments. And Hody goes down. He is no match for Luffy. So Luffy sets out to destroy the Ark. He is punching it with everything he has. And he is willing to destroy everything. On, how do you break apart a boat by punching it? But he's managing. And then the princess is crying. And she's just like, Luffy, stop. You have to stop. This is part of our history. Even though, like my brother said, we don't need our past anymore to destroy it. There's still something here. And Luffy's just like, but it's going to crush and kill everybody. And she's like, no, it won't. Look. And she has called the Neptunes, the Sea Kings, have grabbed onto the chains and they're holding the boat up. And it's not going to crash on Fishman Island anymore. So Luffy can finally relax. And then we get a little bit more explanation, which might work into something that my darling love Mihawk had said previously. The Neptunes had said that they were able to come because the princess had unlocked their pow her power to call to them because of her faith in Luffy. His will and her will, like, combining. I don't, it almost feels like... Luffy's will amplifies others' will to make them more powerful and to protect him. There's some something there which goes into Mihawk saying, like, Luffy has the ability to draw people towards him. And that really feels like what's happened here. And we also get another note on how um, Gold Roger had also been able to hear the Sea Kings and it seems like Luffy was also able to hear this conversation between them and the princess. Uh, the princess brings Luffy back and she's saying like he's been really hurt. He needs blood transfusion. Someone help him. And once again, we're back to that stigma and the law of the fishmen not being able to give blood to humans. But the princess is just like, okay, we're not the same blood type, but my blood's red. His blood is red. That's enough. Like It'll work, right? You can have mine. And of course, everyone hears the princess being willing to give blood to this human pirate. And uh, Chopper's just like, appreciate the sentiment, but it doesn't work that way. No. Um, and Jinbei is just like, we have the same blood type. He can have mine. I'm a pirate. I don't need to follow this law. So they do the blood transfusion. They are connected. We see that despite their differences in appearance on the outside, they are the same and compatible inside. And Luffy looks to Jinbei and is just like, so you going to officially join my crew? And I'm like, yes, God love, please, please, please take Jinbei onto your crew. Yes, 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 yes. And Jinbei, sadly, but respectfully, says, I still have some work I need to do, some things I need to settle, but once that's all done, ask me again, and if you still want me, I will join your crew. And I'm just going to assume that that's a yes, but I have a my omission to do right now, so I'm going to just count Jinbei as a straw hat moving forward, because I need to rank the straw hats um, soon, and um, he's going to be on the list when I rank it. Um... We then cut, we're having a banquet in celebration for our not heroes. Luffy is very specific. They are not the heroes of Fishman Island. He is not sharing their food. Zoro is not sharing his alcohol. Uh, but yes, we're going to have a party and you're all invited. Uh, we get Caribou trying to capture the princess and he is uh, stopped and we get the freed mermaids and he was also trying to steal the treasure. So the straw hats are completely cleared. Robin then goes and has a conversation with the king talking about the information on the Poneglyphs and who is Joy Boy. And we learn that there was a agreement between Joy Boy and a former past Princess Mermaid um, 
that was failed and it was an apology for breaking a promise and the fishmen had agreed to keep the Noah intact and protect it all these generations so a descendant of Joy Boy can come and use it in the future and talking about who Joy Boy is I got no sweet clue I was thinking like Jolly Joy Jolly Jolly Roger so maybe Joy Boy was just a former pirate uh, happy, something, joyous. Um, but then I'm like, who who calls people boy? Like something boy, something boy. Because I had a, there was a voice in my head and like, didn't they always call someone boy? And I realized it was Pegasus from Yu-Gi-Oh saying Kai the boy and Yu-Gi boy. But we also have um, Bon Clay. Bon Clay had said straw boy a couple times before. So I'm not sure if it's just like that kind of vibe for names. Um, so we get then talking about the ancient weapon that Skypea had told us about was located here in Fishman Island. And the king reveals that the um, Poseidon, or the, the weapon of Poseidon, is not just the boat, or that I assumed it would be, it is the princess. The mermaid princess is the weapon. And again, theories for that start to unfold, and it works well with my Roger is evil theory, and I will talk about it um, next. Wrapping up the wrapping up the ending, um, so Zoro, Sanji, and Luffy had gone after Caribou after he had stolen the treasure uh, from the vault in the palace because Nami had learned that if they get it back, they get to keep it. So they went and got that. And on the way back, they see that in the Sweets District, the representatives of Big Mama, uh, a war no emperor of the sea came to collect the sweets owed to her because since my darling, darling boy loves sweetest man alive, God love him, White Beer, my absolute favorite in this series, has passed, God rest his soul. Um, Big Mama had taken over his territory and where White Beard had not for, asked for anything in compensation, he was respected and loved by the people just cause they were his friends and he was protecting them for that reason alone. Uh, Big Mama asked for a certain amount of sweets every month and a, they can't deliver because destruction during this whole Civil War thing, equipment was destroyed, and also what they did have was given to the banquet, which Luffy ate. So Big Mama is going to destroy Fishman Island for not being able to pay her in sweets. Luffy is just like, hey, how dare you? I'll give you this treasure uh, if you spare Fishman Island, but as for who's responsible for eating your sweets, that was me, so come after me. Also, I'm going to come kick your ass, and claim that Fishman Island is actually my territory. Don't you threaten my friends. God love Monkey D. Luffy, who threatens emperors of the sea on a whim when they piss him off and threaten his friends and people who fed him. So that is something that I'm excited to see. They accidentally sent her a bomb as well, because one of the box that had all the, the steroid pills in it uh, is now rigged to explode. Uh, so they gave that to Big Mama. Can't wait to see how that plays out. Um, and that is more or less the end. I'm very excited. They are, have left Fishman Island. The princess has come, said goodbye, said she's no longer going to be a crybaby the next time they meet. And it's sweet and wholesome, and I love it so very much. Uh, correcting a mistake from uh, my previous video, I had said, like, uh, Hantley, Smoker, I think, was in charge of uh, G1 in the New World, but I misspoke. I also mentioned... Uh, Sengoku uh, retired from Fleet Admiral. Uh, so Smoker had just asked a request, made a request to move there because he wants to be where Luffy and them are going and all the other pirates. Uh, it was Akiji who had been nominated or recommended to be Fleet Admiral, but Magma Bastard actually was pushed by the government. So the two of them were fighting for that spot and Magma Bastard actually won, leading to Akiji leaving the government altogether. Um, it was mentioned in the comment section that Magma Bastard ended up uh, winning and becoming uh, the in charge of that. So no, no big deal. I, you probably thought it was already mentioned in a previous arc and I just misunderstood, but it's fine. It's fine. Um, so now we have Magma Bastard being the next one we need to come across in the new world and I need to see him die. All right, putting this at the end just because it's going to include the spoiler I learned recently. And honestly, I really don't think it should count as a spoiler because it's just a character's name. Very obviously a character whose name has a D in it that we don't know of at this point. So if you're only slightly ahead of me in the manga, I don't know when this is revealed. 
but you probably already know it because I'm honestly shocked I went so long with a googling a character's name for an image and there's there's his full name so talking about the Willoughby there's this big thing on um a will being passed on and coming back in future generations so I am really leaning towards the idea of reincarnation or the passing on of a will of an original crew. So what got me into this at first was we first have uh, Monkey D. Luffy. He is very clearly a captain. He states very firmly he uh, is a terrible navigator. He can't lie. He relies on his friends to fill out those roles in the ship. But he is the captain. He can fight. He can protect those he cares about. Now... What led me onto the reincarnation thing is um, Gold Roger. Now, when, in Skypea, we had writing next to one of the Poneglyphs uh, in that language, and I'm interpreting that to be Roger being a historian. The comment section told me he can't read the Poneglyphs the way Robin does, but he, there was still writing in that type of language next to one of the Poneglyphs. So something's going on there. He was researching the Poneglyphs. Something was going on with them looking into the void century. I'm going with he's an historian of some type. Um, and then the final straw in making me switch from this being a tinfoil hat theory to, hey, this genuinely might be a thing, is that, uh, spoiler for the name, is La has D in it as well. He is the surgeon of death um, and therefore a doctor. So we have three roles in a ship. Uh, finally, you have Marshall D. Teach, who is a traitor. Every group needs someone to, like, betray them. It's like someone in the group betrays you, except the Straw Hats. No one is allowed to betray the Straw Hat crew. So I really do actually think that the Willa D. and an original crew of people with D in the name, or maybe a jolly pirate ship of D, I don't know. But there's something there. How does Garp and Saul and Ace and Ace's mother all fit into this? I don't really know. I'm leaning towards Garp being like the right-hand man. He is very good at following orders, very loyal. For all I know, Saul was a musician. He did like to laugh and joke and sing, I guess. I don't know. Um, doesn't work perfectly, but I feel there's something there. Now, let's go into my tinfoil hat theory that was a joke. It really was a joke when I started off, but has slowly turned into, I think I might genuinely believe this is the end goal for One Piece. I don't know how crazy I am. Feel free to tell me how crazy I am. So we have three ancient weapons, the Pluton, the Poseidon, and Uranus. So they're all named after the Greek gods of the, or I don't know if it's Greek or Roman, doesn't matter, um, of the sea, the sky, and hell, and, or the dead, or whatever. Bear with me for my tinfoil hat theory. Should I get a tinfoil hat? Should, I'm sorry, I did not make a tinfoil hat. We have the Pluton named after the god of the underworld. Awful convenient that my tinfoil hat theory involves Roger either having faked his death or being resurrected in some way, becoming the god of the underworld. And now that I know a person can be the ultimate weapon, I like this. So he is now the Pluton. And Luffy has sailed to the ends of the uh, Grand Line, the New World. He's at the the One Piece. He's found the One Piece. He's happy. We're celebrating. Shanks is there. Luffy gives him the hat back because now he's king of the pirates. But we hear a voice being like, I'm, you are no king of the pirate. That title is taken. And Roger steps forward, who thanks Shanks for choosing such a good vessel because something had to happen for his resurrection or something like that. Maybe something at the One Piece caused his resurrection. I still like the idea of he didn't find the One Piece, but need someone else to do it. I don't know. Anywho, thanks Shanks for his party played. Shanks is equally shocked because I uh, do not have the heart and soul to make him a villain. But we could also have Shanks be the villain and have been working with Gold Roger all this time, depending on how much heartbreak we want. Luffy is shocked as Gold Roger takes the hat and puts it on and declares war across the world, starting with Fishman Island, or technically Sabadee. 
um, and is will, is going to destroy that. As the prophecy only states that a man with a straw hat is going to destroy Fishman Island or bring its ruin. We could also technically have uh, Roger possessing Luffy um, and that making the Pluton if we want to keep the, the general vibe of the look of the person who um, is destroying the island. Now, the princess, Poseidon, that weapon comes forward and she is fighting the Pluton, but she is no match and Luffy is forced to watch someone close to him who he has named Crybaby and looks upon like a little sister be attacked and possibly killed. And it is heartbreaking. And now he declares that Luffy, assuming he hasn't been possessed, is going to reactivate um, the, the third weapon or maybe create a fourth. And maybe I like the idea of him create, opening the third because him being like the god of the sky and sun and air, all that, that just looks, that just, that's just pretty. Um, so Robin and Frankie build him a ship and he becomes that third weapon and it's a full on three fights war among all of them. And if that is just not fun, I don't know what is. I think it actually works well. So my tinfoil hat theory has become a legit, I want this to happen. I want to see that. Uh, let me know what you think. Let me know how crazy I am. But I am going to now start the next arc because I couldn't uh, read it until I finished this. I really, really, really should have broken this up into two, two videos. So I apologize if I rushed over some things. All right, I will talk to you later. Um, but before I take off, I do need to look at the comment sections in the community post for Fishman Island. I've been waiting for this. Uh, okay, someone asked what I thought about Ace's promise that he won't die. That was for previous arcs. Um, yeah, no, I cried like a little baby. So much. I All of the end of Marine Fort and the post-war arc, and even into so Return to Sabity, I was just a sobbing mess for the entirety of it. Did you expect Roger being the previous owner of the straw hat? No, I did not. Mostly because when I think of people wearing a straw hat, like even looking at Shanks previously wearing, it just doesn't fit. I feel like Luffy is the only one who can pull off and really owns that hat. So I was not expecting Roger to have it at all. Uh, your thoughts on the reveal of Kuma protecting the ship's Ansa's alliance with the revolutionary? I always assumed he was still in alliance with them, um, but it was nice to get that 100% confirmation. And I want to know why he, why they let him still like implant that order to protect that ship. So I want to know what that doctor's involvement is now. Compare the character designs of before versus after time skip. I'll have to make a complete video just so I can put them side by side. Oh, where do you think Sengoku went? Do you think he... Yeah, because he retired. I never gave any consideration on where he went. I'm going to... Someone told me he's friends with Garp, like, outside of work. So maybe he's retired with him somewhere? Like, they're... They're having a chat on how they feel the government is being uh, corrupted and especially with Magma Bastard, like his war crimes and now he's in charge. Is there any way that they're with Kobe like plotting to take down Magma Bastard so they can work to rebuild the government from the inside? Because Garp's not going to betray the government. That's That ship has sailed. So he can only work to restore it from the inside. So I imagine he's working with Sengoku. I don't know. I would like to know what you thought of Oa's approach to racial discrimination against the Fishmen. I would also like to know how you feel about Arlong and his ideals of Sabity and the Fishman Islands. After um, Oda handled this so much better than I ever thought possible. The characters in this were really designed to explain the themes and what was going on rather than being actual characters in terms of uh, fish, the fish tiger, Hody, and uh, the queen. But they worked so well. And they represent both how hard it is to break the cycle, the environment you're raised in, and the effects it has on the next generation. And the importance of even if you personally can't let go of the hatred, the importance of not instilling it on the next generation. It was so well done. Um, how I feel about Arlong after Sabadi and Fishman Island. I did not ask to sympathize with that man. That's all I can say. 
Okay, Fishman Island had been hinted at for a long time in the story. Any expect expectations going in, yeah. It's been brought up a lot. It was brought up with Arlong. It was brought up as the site of Poseidon back when we were talking about um, Skypea. So I really had nothing going in, and I didn't expect all the racial angles, but I probably should have, especially considering what we learned in Sabine and the mermaids in slavery. Oh, I would like to know your thoughts on how Luffy's childhood and traumas influence his way of thinking in the present, the way he seeks companionship because he doesn't want to live his life alone anymore. He doesn't want to live his life alone, and now he's like, he's drawing people to him so easily. He is really big on fighting for the underdogs and people achieving their dream. And taking note of back in the post-war I had took for granted when he stated his dream that it was to be the king of the pirates, but then it was mentioned in the comment section that um, that might not actually be what he said, and we were just keeping a mystery of what he, his actual dream is, so there might be a secondary dream there that being king of the pirates will allow him to achieve. And I guess his goal could be like my darling love Whitebeard, who is just like, I don't care about treasure, I care about my friends and making a family. So his entire viewpoints are just, I'm going to help these people, I'm going to help my friends, no matter the cost. I don't care what you threaten me with, it's never going to stop me, because I'll protect my friends, I'll protect my crew. And he's drawing everyone towards him, and they protect him, and in turn he protects them. And it is really good to see how he grew up so alone and afraid, just wanting people around him. And now he's amassed an army who would protect him. Okay, a lot of these are about the post-time skip arc, just, or sorry, the post-war arc, just because I didn't start doing these community posts till then, till after then. Um, how do you feel about Sabo being mentioned, shown for the first time that late into the story? Personally, I'm not a fan. A shadow of a cup, to me, is not appropriate to storytell, or not appropriate foreshadowing. I would have at least liked, uh, Us um, not, why do I keep saying Usopp? Uh, Luffy to at least have mentioned once I know what it's like to lose a brother or a sibling if he had interacted with someone who was also grieving that loss he could have said that then and we would say I'm sorry what and then when Ace showed up we're like oh, okay so we have one sibling we must have lost another and then we got Sabo it was just like a single throwaway line would have been all I would have preferred how do you feel about Garp now that you've seen his past with the boys and his current post-war interaction with Dadam I love their foster mother for beating him up and saying, how dare you not protect those boys? I don't care what you're going through. Luffy is going through worse. Garp is still on my list. I need to see how Luffy responds to him next. Like, I understand his viewpoint. I understand pirates are the bad guys. Navy is good. He's been with that navy for so long he's been a marine he's got friends there he can't just betray them i understand that but how dare you garb i have not forgiven you how do i feel about demonstration of different types of hockey i personally like hockey i learned recently that a lot of people in the fandoms are not a big fan of hockey just in general being because they like the devil fruit powder kind of overrides it sometimes i still like the idea of like um crocodiles weakness to water uh, the lightning guy's weakness to, to rubber and Luffy's weakness to sharp objects kind of thing. St I want that all to still play a role. I want the devil fruit power to still have a exploitable weakness and not just be hockey allows you to punch it. But I do like the armor at hockey. Oh, uh, correction for previously. I had said that, um... I thought that my darling love the Mihawk used hockey to take down ships, which apparently might not be the case. My interpretation was the armor hockey, like you armor yourself with it, but I thought you could also armor a sword and like throw it. And that was the attack. So I was told, no, that's not it. So apparently there's a different type of power also being involved in the future that I don't know about yet. So I still have a lot to learn about how the hockey actually works. But I do like how it was set up previously in the story. Like, like this comment had said, uh, Shanks taking down the Sea Beast as well as using instincts in his fight with Mr. Three. And a couple times with Zoro as well. No, I, I like how it was set up before we got an actual explanation of it. And it explains events previously. That was, that was perfect.
your thoughts on how uh, Hody's reasons for hating humans. So perfect. His reasonings are I was born and raised on stories of humans being terrible. They've done nothing to me personally, but I have just been constantly bombarded with words and thoughts and anger and hatred toward them. And it is now my core soul is made of just hatred because of what everyone around me has told me and raised me on. So I am on a righteous path to kill all humans and anyone who supports them. That, I was not expecting that. And it was the perfect motivation for him and the ideals of this story. Okay, when Whitebeard died, what were your thoughts on how it was narrated as if it was a legend passed down from generation to generation? I did get the vibe. This almost feels like I'm being told a story or a textbook of what happened uh, or like someone was narrating something. So my only thought is I don't want the end of One Piece to be like this was the story of the Pirate King or this is a memoir. That is the one like character trope, not character trope, but story trope thing that I'm not a fan of. So I don't want that to happen. Looking at you, season eight of Game of Thrones. Do you think that the addition of hockey will take away the creative fights One Piece has till this point? Also, what do you think Luffy's dream is? Um, I am worried that hockey will override finding a creative solution around people's devil fruit powers. Yes, I am worried about that. I hope it doesn't. What do I think Luffy's dream is? I'm going to stick with he has the same dream as Whitebeard, and that's just to find a loving family. How do you feel about Hody, uh, Cody Jones and Vander Decken as the antagonists of this arc? I mentioned it previously. Um, I like them. I do. Uh, Deccan is just weird and hilarious, and um, Hody's backstory and his motivations are perfect for this arc, but they do feel like characters meant to further the plot and themes rather than characters that stand alone on their own. So I don't expect them to come back, especially considering Howdy was just like aged to death because of like his hatred has aged him. Taking these pills had destroyed him and he, now he's old and going to die. So they really did feel more like the personification of themes more than in like characters in their own right. But I like that for this story. Do you feel they compare to the previous antagonists? Where do you place them in comparison, like someone like Crocodile, Moria, and Lucy? See, Lucci, I still hate him so very much for how dismissive he was about having lived in Water 7 all these years and making no friends or connections and willing to just kill and destroy everything around him. This is a complete psychopath born and raised by the government to just be a psychopathic killer, it feels like. And that is perfect for his character. Crocodile is flair and dramatics. I live for the applause. And I don't know what his thought process is because he is not above attacking the government. I'm most interested in seeing how Crocodile is going to play a role in the story. Is he going to be an antagonist? Is he going to join up with our crew? Are they going to, what's what's going on here? We've got lots of cover panels about uh, Vivi and Alabasta. So what happens if they interact again? Uh, it looks like we're getting a re reunion of all his men coming back. So I'm like, I, I want to see more of Crocodile. So I think they're all good for the stories that they're telling. Oda has a good way of picking whether this should be a character focused villain, um, just a vibes villain or does this character just need to further the themes that I'm trying to tell so if we had crocodile in uh would not make sense for him to be down here on Fishman Island surrounded by water but I don't feel his type of character would have had the same impact as Howdy did. Howdy I still say Howdy should be how his name is pronounced because it's stupid and he is stupid and needed to die. Oh, just how cool was Luffy dodging the pacifist beam saying too slow? That was one of my favorite moments. Loved it. How has your hit list been updated so far? I'm sure Sabo's parents and the Celestial Dragons and Nobles have been added to it. Yes, yes, they are on the list. 
pretty much um, the hit list consists of everyone I mentioned, the Marine Fort one, and then it's just like at the bottom, nobles, with the exception of and like Vivi and her parents, because like they're, she's a princess and the king. So unless specifically stated that they are not horrible, just assume all nobles are on the hit list. Uh, Kelsey and I also agree. There's a lot here about uh, Old Roger's hats and the straw hat there. Parallels between how Luffy treated the princess and Kobe. I didn't think of Kobe, but then the comment also mentions uh, how Ace treated him when they were kids. The How Ace treated Luffy when they were kids was why I love that princess and their relationship. Her, her and Luffy's relationship. I would die for either of them. So sweet. What do you think of the... Madam, I can't pronounce her name, Shashar Shari's premonition of Luffy destroying the island. I still say it's not going to be Luffy. It's going to be someone else wearing the straw hat. Or it could be Luffy destroying Fishman Island to bring them up to the surface. Like you have to destroy the old to get to the new kind of thing. But I'm, I'm leaning more towards just someone else wearing a straw hat. Also, is that Madam Lady owner of the um, Mermaid Cafe... Arlong's sister. I forgot to mention that. I, I feel like she's his sister, so that's interesting. What purpose do you think the Noah serves? Do you think we'll have a lot of relevance in the future? Uh, yes, it's going to have relevance in the future, because clearly someone told somebody not to destroy it. The Neptunes and Sea Kings are taking it off somewhere to be fixed, and I'm assuming it's going to act as a power source for um, the Poseidon ancient weapon. Maybe. Not a clue. She's going to ride it. Don't know. Going to be involved. Fishman Island was actually not super, was not super popular when it came out, but it always been a breathtaking for me for the way it handled the themes of persecution and prejudice. But while I can talk about that forever, the one thing that always sticks with me the most is the nothing panel by Howdy that emptiness the emptiness as the prince calls it completely agree that was a standout moment and the themes of this arc were perfectly handled Cody is part of an ostracized population with a myriad of legitimate reasons to take up a cause and not a single one is important to him he just hates he likes to hate for no other reason than the joy of hating he was raised to hate yes I did also like at the end of the arc um the king had mentioned that he was going to condemn all fish, the Fishman district and everyone there who have been raised in that hatred will be moved to live on Fishman Island. So that's good. That should have happened a long time ago. Want to know what you think of Brooke making it big as a musician? So I didn't go into that very much in Sabadee, but here it makes a note of his, his control of the soul due to the devil fruit power and in, influencing other people uh, through his music and affecting maybe their soul and fighting with souls. So I feel like that's actually going to play a bigger role in the future. Him as a musician and the soul itself and how it can be influenced. Uh, your thoughts on the strengths of the Straw Hats? Do you like how their abilities have evolved so far? Perfect. Uh, Nami specifically, I've said many, many, many times, I love her as a navigator, um, getting more weather powers. I like Usopp. Uh, oh, there was, uh, what was it? I had said, um, he used to tell these grand outrageous lies and now somewhere in this arc, he had, uh, said like, I alone am going to stop you. I can take on this many of you. And they're like, stop lying. And he's like, huh, I used to tell such grand lies about me having like hundreds of men supporting me. Now I just need me. And he's shooting these monster plants. That was perfect, Rusa. Okay, this comment is also saying they're not a big fan of Hody compared to Arlong. I'll understand the differences because Arlong was a character. He was meant to be a character and a hatred and he had a personal impact. Whereas, Hor however you pronounce that stupid name, uh, was more a personification of themes. But it really, I felt it really worked well for this arc. Did Fishman Island sell your opinion on Sanji any further? Yes, but I'm mostly ignoring it. Who had the best outfits in this arc? Uh, assuming we're just talking about back to the return to Sabade. Uh, going to be Frankie, because it's the perfect thing of him. It is so Frankie. It is exactly what he would make for himself. 
Uh, Nami looks beautiful. Robin looks beautiful. They're all they're all great. I like Zoro's new design. I'm pretend, pretending Sanji don't exist, so I can't even remember what he looked like before and after. Luffy with a scar. They're they're all perfect. <laughs> I have to ask what you what do you think of the newest Straw Hat Caribou? Isn't he the best? Oh my god, is he coming back? Can't can't wait to see what he gets up to. At this point, Oda was known for not killing off characters except in backstories. Then everyone's shocked when Ace and Whitebeard die, but now there's a time skip, meaning their deaths are part of the backstory. True. And also, I did not expect them to die because of that. I have been told Oda doesn't kill his characters except in backstories. Okay, a couple here are talking about uh, watching the movies because I said I was going to do that. I don't have access to all the movies for free, so I might have to buy some. And which sucks because the anime has been a disappointment to me. So I'm not looking forward to having to pay money to watch the animation if it's the same pacing. Did you notice that Luffy's new design has frills on his clothing? I didn't take notice of that. I need to look at his design again. One thing in the previous arc that I didn't take mention of. During the flashback conversation, Roger and Whitebeard, Roger offered to tell where Laughing Tail Rafi is. This is supposed to be the last island where the One Piece is. This means that Whitebeard was offered to be king of the pirates, but Whitebeard refused due to having no interest in it. Okay. Okay, and would you have preferred for, like, the flashback post-war arc to be before Marine Fort, so you understand Luffy and Ace's relationships better? Actually, no. Just because I liked how first we grieved Ace's loss as Luffy's brother, and we really only felt pain because Luffy was in pain, but then we got to grieve him a second time when we grieved him as Ace. When we fell in love with him through this fat flashback knowing he had died. So I grieved twice for him. And that was really well done. If that had been first, I would have known he was going to die. Oh, we're getting an in-depth flashback on their history and relationship? He's dead. So I really like the order that it was in. Okay, a couple that I've already talked about. Tinfoil hat theories, Joy Boy, and all that, so... All right, I am off to the next island and arc, and I am going to be stretching out the straw hat. All right, I will talk to you later.